in episode four of The Last Dance, we see you on the Bulls plane uh, with that trusty handy cam of yours. How close were you to maybe relenting and giving some of that footage to Jason Hare? You do stuff like this. <laughs> oh, wow. This is not even about half of it. Goodness me. Uh, just for those, well, people listening, because uh, no one's watching this except for us. <laughs> <laughs> you've just held up a whole handful and you've got big hands, lots of handicam tapes loaded with who knows what. I mean, what can you tell us? What sort of stuff is on there? That scene that they showed on on the plane where Michael says, oh, security, highest paid media player here. And I looked at him and said, no, you know, Ahmad, I'm referring to Ahmad Rashad, makes a lot more money than I do. <laughs> that was a great line. Then you are in Australia right now. You're talking NBA basketball. You're talking great teams. You're talking great individual players. Takes it off and there's number 23. And of course, Johnny goes nuts. So we're all getting first bumps thinking about it now. I just tried to go out there and play my game. I have no idea what you're talking about, Adam. I don't like anybody. I'm not a people person. Strand, you made the pass. Yes. Christian, can you catch the ball? Yes. All the stars were aligned and all the muscles fired at the right time. And I was able to get off the ground and throw one down. I was saving that as a surprise for you. And now, introducing your host for In All Airness, Adam Ryan. Welcome to episode 104. Thanks for joining me. Today, the next in my series of bonus shows devoted to the Last Dance docuseries. My special guest is three-time NBA champion of the Chicago Bulls, Bill Winnington. Bill was the first guest to appear on my podcast way back in 2012. A big thanks to another great friend of the show, Steve Cashel, uh, listen to episode 102, for helping me reconnect with Bill. This conversation was recorded after episode four of The Last Dance had aired. We discussed numerous topics, including the Bulls' preseason trip to France in 1997, Bill's relationship to GM Jerry Krause, some Scotty Pippen and Dennis Rodman memories, plus how much handicam footage does Bill actually have in his possession. Towards the end of the episode, I'll share another great podcast review. If you can spare a moment or two, please add your review via your listening app. It will be most appreciated. Show notes for this episode and access to a huge archive of past episodes are available at inallairness.com. Now, on to the show. My guest today was gracious enough to be the first person to appear on my podcast way back in 2012. He's been a fixture of the Chicago Bulls franchise since the 1994 season, first in his six seasons as a player, and then following his final year with Sacramento, returning to the Windy City, where he's been a staple ever since as he nears his 20th season as color commentator and analyst for Bulls Radio. Bill Wennington, thank you for joining me. I have a pleasure. Nice to be back with you. I must not have done a good job in the first one because you haven't asked me back since then. <laughs> Quite the contrary. I'd love to have you back on any time. You're most welcome. But I'm excited to chat with you today. And it's a very good time to chat because of the Last Dance documentary, uh, ESPN and Netflix, the 10-part series. Uh, we're up to episode four so far has aired. Episode one starts with your Bulls, the 1998 preseason, as you're traveling to France to take part in the uh, and, and win the McDonald's Championship uh, in Paris. Just from your perspective, uh, what do you remember most about that visit and just sort of some of the sights and sounds that you took in whilst you were there in Paris, Bill? It was fun to go with the team, and uh, Jerry Reisdorf was very generous and it allowed everyone to take their wives uh, with them if they wanted. Unfortunately, it was during my son's birthday, October 15th, and we'd been to Paris a couple of times before, so she was like, you know, I don't want to leave him alone on his birthday, so she stayed, but uh, the team went. It was fun. We did a couple of fun tour things with the team. Uh, I remember uh, WGN Dan Rohn was there, so we went around and, and did a, a little shoot, so to speak, at the Louvre and a couple of restaurants and, and had fun. But uh, the games itself were fun because it was different for us uh, and, and traveling at the time. It was it was a nice getaway from the monotony that we had been uh, going through for the previous two years. And so it was, it was a nice change. You're featured quite prominently in each of the first four episodes of The Last Dance. You're either interviewed on camera or, obviously, uh, you're appearing in practice or, or game footage. Uh, what are your thoughts generally just on how the series so far has set the scene simultaneously with history of the team, coupled with the, the new footage that uh, has surfaced from the 1998 season? So far, it's been very accurate. I can't argue with anything they've done. I don't think Michael went to Vegas to get the hotel room, and that kind of led that on. I think Michael may have come back and got Dennis at his house, which was real close to the Birdo Center, but 
uh, in the video itself, it, it looks a little bit like Michael went to Vegas to, to get him, but I don't believe that to be the case. I, I'm pretty sure Dennis was back, but just not at practice. And Michael went to his house to get him when he did get him. And, and that was the job that uh, our trainer, Wally Blaze, was uh, assigned to do many times during Dennis's uh, stint with us. And because he only lived literally five minutes from the Birdo Center. So it really wasn't far for him to get it. And I, I think that was by design by Dennis even. But the documentary so far has been very accurate. I'm really glad that you touched on that footage there that they show. It, it does infer that Jordan goes to Las Vegas to, to stop this holiday of sorts that Dennis is on, but I was skeptical of it at the time, and whilst I've enjoyed thoroughly, couldn't have enjoyed more, really, the first four episodes, I would have thought maybe back in Chicago he could have gone and, and actually sort of given Dennis a bit of a wake-up call, literally, but thank you for uh, perhaps sharing your thoughts on that one as well. Uh, no worries. Now, Dennis and Michael, they, they go to Vegas a few times. I know when we were in Utah, they went a couple of times. So that, that might be coming up a little bit later on uh, as we get closer to the playoffs in the documentary. But Phil would give us a, a day or two off here and there. And those guys had the means and the ability to, to get places. They'd run off and do what they needed to do. For the most part, uh, the rest of us would just kind of hang around and wait. Uh, I can only imagine. Um, now, in 2004, you released a book with Kent McDill, which is titled Bill Wennington's Tales from the Bulls Hardwood. I still need to add that to my collection, but I read an excerpt of it online just recently, and I'd just love to briefly ask you about a wonderful tidbit that appears in that. Um, your connection to Michael Jordan goes back to at least 1981, when you played together in the McDonald's High School All-American game. However, when the opportunity presented itself for you to become teammates on the Bulls, in October of 1993, it was very short-lived. Uh, I believe there's only a, a few days where you crossed over as teammates before Jordan's impending announcement of his retirement. Do you remember the few days there that you had being teammates with Jordan before the, uh, the actual news broke? And, and how was the news of that first retirement, which basically shocked the world? Actually, only seen him once or twice at the Birdo Center. Now, hindsight, he was probably coming in to shore up the details of his retirement. But obviously, he wasn't telling anyone. And we talked briefly, just like, hey, it'll be fun. And he was just planning, yeah, it'd be fun to play with you this year. We haven't played this in a long time. And obviously, then uh, he retires. And the way it broke was he was throwing out the first pitch at the White Sox game. I'm I can't remember offhand who they were playing. Uh, but he threw out the first pitch. And I happened to be at the game, uh, being new to Chicago. And obviously, Jerry Reinsdorf, owning both teams, was able to uh, obtain a ticket. And somewhere around the fourth or fifth inning, the rumor starts spreading around and people start coming, hey, Bill, you're with the Bulls now. What do you think about Michael retiring? And I said, I have not heard anything. So everyone's now running to the radios and TV monitors to see what's happening. And it does break at the game that he's retiring. And, you know, we're all shocked and can't believe it. And obviously I'd just seen him and knew nothing about it, but I had not been there. And I'm sure at that point he'd already discussed it with Phil and Scotty and uh, Jerry Reinsdorf and Jerry Krause. I think two or three days later, we start training camp. And I remember Steve Kerr and I were talking before, and he goes, well, Billy, we picked a good time to come to Chicago. <laughs> and uh, it actually ended up being a great time because that first year was very special because we saw Scotty really emerge and, and become the leader and the great player that he was as a leader. And we won 55 games when no one really thought we were going to win 40 games. So it was a lot of fun. It ended up being a, a great year. And obviously, when Michael comes back a year and a half later, it's phenomenal. I did not have any idea that you were at that baseball game when the news of Jordan's retirement uh, came to be. That's fascinating to hear. Uh, you mentioned Scotty Pippen there and that 1994 season, your first with the team. I was fortunate to attend one Bulls game in January of 1994. You played the 76ers and it was a blowout. You guys won by about 30 points. But at least I got to go to Chicago Stadium and take in the atmosphere that's been a, a highlight of my life ever since, and that was a good almost 30 years ago. In your book, you actually say that Pippen is your favorite bull. In episode two of The Last Dance, we learn about the adversity uh, both at home and in college that Pippen had to deal with just to make it to the NBA. Uh, you wrote that Scotty handled his relationships with his teammates differently and, and better than others. Um, can you point to an example of when uh, you noticed Scotty doing that just over the years? Well. Always, he was he was accountable for his actions on the floor with us and to us as teammates. And two things I can give to you now. One, everyone will know because it was the 1.8 seconds where he decided to sit out playing the New York Knicks uh, in that season because Phil called a play for Tony Kukoc. And Scotty 
was upset, wanted the play to be called for him, felt it was unfair, but Phil called the play for him. So, so Scotty said, fine, I'm out, and just sat down. So Phil made a substitution real quick. Tony hit the shot, so we win the game. So we go down into the locker room. We get in the locker room, we all get settled in, and Bill Cartwright comes in and starts talking. And he was really one of the team leaders, but more of a silent leader when Michael and Scotty were there, but stepped up and, and talked about the game, not being bigger than the game, and really gave a, a heartfelt speech. And Scotty immediately stood up and apologized. He was sincere. He was a little teary-eyed, as was Bill, because, it, I mean, it was a big thing. And, again, I'm a new guy, and Steve Kerr and myself are in there, and all this is going on, and we're just like, whoa. Scotty was accountable for it, apologized, said it wouldn't happen again. He let the moment get away from him. Phil comes in right after that, and I'm assuming he heard everything from the door and says, enough said, practice tomorrow at 10 o'clock. For us, it was over. Scotty was very contrite, very sincere, uh, honestly felt horrible for what he did and let us down and and promised that it would never happen again, and it didn't. So for us, it was over. Now, the media is not the thing. They come in, and it starts all over again, and they try to hang on to it. To this day, it's still a big thing, but as far as the, the team goes and teammates that were there, it was handled, handled very well at the time, and it was over. And as a teammate on the floor, uh, we're playing Indiana, and I'm actually playing the four spot. I'm guarding Antonio Davis while Luke Longley is guarding Rick Smits. They're playing a big lineup, so we match up big against them. And Luke is supposed to play Rick Smits by himself, one-on-one in the low post. And after the second or third series that I'm in the game playing, Scotty and I are isolated uh, on the other side of the floor at the foul line. And Scotty says to me, Billy, next time down, if it goes into Rick, you go. And I said, all right, because on the floor, we listen to each other, we communicate, and we talk, and and we make changes on the fly on the floor. So the ball goes into Rick Smits. I'm doubled down. He catches it. I get there. I'm in a way. He turns to me, sees me there, turns the other way, and Luke knocks the ball away, and we get a steal. Play goes on. Everything goes on. Well, the next day in film, Phil stops that play and says, Wennington, what are you doing here? The game plan was not to go down and double team. And I'm thinking to myself, all right, well, as soon as he stops, I know it's coming. So I'm thinking, well, I'll just say I thought I should do this. And as I say, well, I thought I, and Scotty jumped in and said, Phil, I told him to go. Wow. Phil looked at me, looked at Scotty. He goes, all right, you guys are communicating on the floor. You guys got to play the game that you see out there on the floor. And it's over. Where other players that I would played with have done things like that on the floor, and they just let you hang there and see what you're going to say to coach and see how you stand up for yourself or what you say or or whatever. But Scotty was very accountable for his actions. He told me to do it. And he, he stopped Phil right there and said, hey, I did it. Don't worry about it. That's a great example. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. A hot topic in the last dance, which I'm sure you've been asked about countless times, is the relationship between Jerry Krause, the Bulls GM, uh, select players, and, and notably, of course, coach Phil Jackson. You talk about Jerry in episode one of the series. Just briefly, how were your interactions with, with Krause throughout your six seasons as a player with Chicago, Bill? I got along with Jerry as far as getting along with him. I didn't talk to him. I think I went to his house once the last year that I was a player. I went to his house one time. And it was that kind of us against the world mentality. A lot of coaches use that strategy, and it's a very good way to unite the players, to bond together and fight, not against each other, with each other to win basketball games. And Jerry was a unique individual. As a person, if you could separate the man from the businessman, you could see that he was a caring person. It happened to me early on when I was in working out, getting extra shots up, and I had my young son with me, and Rob had drift away from the court and went upstairs. I run around looking for him and I go up and I see Jerry rolling around on the floor with my son playing with him and they're, you know, <laughs> playing hand tag and he's just playing with him. And I'm looking at it and I say, you know, that's pretty neat. That's a nice man. Hmm. He's caring. He's occupying a little kid who's just running around and bored in a building while his dad's doing work. And I come up and I see that. Now, there was plenty of other times business-wise where things didn't quite work out the way I'd hoped and I didn't like that. And A lot of players didn't like that. And some players lost a lot of money because they didn't have leverage in negotiating. So if that happens, it's easy to get upset at Jerry. The other thing is in business with the Bulls, Jerry had a lot of quirks. I mean, he was very secretive. Uh, If he was onto something, he'd flat out lie to you and tell you a a non-truth. That was very odd. He couldn't get out of his own way at, at times and would say things that just upset everyone else, especially players and coaches who are down there on the floor uh, working hard. The obvious one is, uh, you know, players don't win championships, organizations do. And that's offensive to a player. 
and, and it's hard. Now, whether he meant it that way or what he was thinking about, it doesn't matter. It's obviously perception in the way it's perceived by people that makes it offensive or not offensive. So, and that stuck with him. And, and it was easy to understand and see the difficulties he had relating to people. He just wasn't a people person. So that all added to the situation and made it, made it difficult. And Scotty and Michael had obviously issues with, with the Bulls. And Scotty wanted a bigger contract. And, and Michael was still upset because he traded away his best friend, Charles Oakley. So they all had things in the background that were feeding into this relationship. Thank you for elaborating. Uh, we mentioned Dennis a little bit earlier. Uh, in episode three, we learned more about the history of Dennis Rodman. Now, you entered the NBA, I think, one season ahead of the worm. How would you compare and, and contrast playing against Dennis versus the three seasons that you were together as teammates? Well, when you're playing against him, you're the object of his ability to play because he's pushing you, rebounding over you, boxing you out. And obviously, he was playing with Detroit, who at the time was a very physical team using everything in their power to win basketball games. And, and they played very physically, very cheap. They gave you cheap shots. Rick Mahorn is a friend today. I, I talked to Rick, and Rick is a guy that is able to separate what happens on the floor and off the floor. Unfortunately, some other players on that team are just that way all the time. And it's not a very nice thing to be. But we'll leave it right there. You knew when you were going to play Detroit, it was going to be a physical game. And, and Dennis was part of that and played the role very well. He understood, and they were doing what the team does to win basketball games. And that's what happens. When I came to the Bulls, I played differently and had a different attitude than I did when I played with the Mavericks or Sacramento uh, before that, or even in Italy, because you take on the team's mentality. And Chicago played very hard and was attentive 100% every day in practice and in games. If you didn't hold your end of the bargain and, and put out 100%, you were going to get left behind. But Dennis, when you're playing against him, had that bad boy mentality. Now, when he came to Chicago, he fit in, uh, like Scotty Pippen said, like a hand in a glove. And it really was because Dennis wanted to win. And he was really a lot smarter basketball-wise. And even as a person, people won't want to agree with this, but he really is a smart man and understood how to play basketball, the, the angles, the defensive angles, the cuts, everything he had to do defensively to get a rebound. And offensively as well, just understanding where he fit in and where the best place to get a rebound in the offense that we were running. And he fit right in. Plus, he was a phenomenal defender, uh, really one of the best defenders on the floor at all times. And we had four guys that could do that, and Dennis, Scotty, Michael, and Ron Harper. And really, when I go back and look at those games, and I'm fortunate here in Chicago, uh, NBC Chicago Sports has been playing some old Bulls games here during the uh, pandemic because the, there are no regular sports. And that's the thing that jumps out. I knew that our teams were good, but when you, I look back at them and watch the games and see that defense with those guys and what Dennis could do guarding any one of five guys on the floor, and you saw him guarding uh, a lot of times Patrick Ewing, Shaquille O'Neal, and even small four Reggie Miller at times where he got switched off onto him. And he was so athletic and versatile as a defender and just understood how to play defense was amazing and helped us out tremendously. And he's a big reason why we won those second three championships. That's a great summation. Just on those rebroadcasts you're talking about, what have you enjoyed most about watching those all these years removed? The memories flood back, just like watching the last dance now and, and old Bulls games. And it's not something I've done really at all before. This is the first time I've actually sat down and watched it because you run out of things to do, to be quite honest. Uh, we're sitting here, we've been o over 40 days now without a whole lot to do. So I started watching. I watched a couple of the games. I'm not going to lie and say I watched them all, but it was fun to just see those teams, and it brings back a lot of great memories and what, what it was like. But seeing the defense and seeing those guys play defense was a lot of fun. Offense is great, and I love playing offense. I like to shoot the ball and you know, watching Michael and Scotty play offense and what they can do with their bodies is phenomenal. But if you love the game and you see the way they play defense and how hard they worked at it, that's the amazing thing to me, and that's really what strikes me as why that team was so good. It's great to hear you reflecting on this. Uh, I appreciate your time. Just a couple more quick questions, if you don't mind, Bill. Also, in episode four of The Last Dance, we see you on the Bulls plane uh, with that trusty handy cam of yours. Do you have any idea of roughly how much footage that you would have accrued over the years in terms of what you recorded personally with the, the handy cam? A and further to that... Um, how close were you to maybe relenting and giving some of that footage to Jason Hare in terms of uh, making it available in the documentary? You need stuff like this. <laughs> oh, wow. This is not even about half of it. 
Goodness me. Uh, just for those, well, people listening, because uh, no one's watching this except for us. <laughs> <laughs> You've just held up a whole handful and you've got big hands, lots of handicam tapes loaded with who knows what. I mean, what, what can you tell us? What sort of stuff is on there? It's a lot of the stuff of us just traveling, uh, going through airports. When we had to go through airports to and from airplanes, uh, a little bit in hotels, maybe eating a meal once in a while. Uh, a lot of stuff on the airplane. That scene that they showed on on the plane where Michael says, oh, security, highest paid media player here. And I looked at him and said, no, you know, Ahmad, I'm referring to Ahmad Rashad, makes a lot more money than I do. That was a great line. He started laughing. <laughs> it's moments like that. I was a camera buff. I like taking pictures. So I, was, I have pictures when I was in Dallas, when I played in Sacramento. And video started getting pretty good in the mid-90s because the cameras got smaller. Originally, I had one of the first... Uh, uh, video cameras that you can have for home videos and, and the cameras. I mean, it's this big. It's just uh, so really too big to travel with, but uh, they got much smaller. As you can see, I had a, uh, a smaller one, but I have not gone back and looked at them very often. Since the last dance came out, they asked me if they could use them, and I started to look through it to see, and I was kind of skeptical because I'd always told the guys not, I wouldn't do it. And, and they told me, well, Michael's on board. He said it's okay. And I was like, yeah. And I thought about it. I watched a couple of tapes and there were a couple of things on there. And they're not bad. I'm not talking about guys out at night, you know, getting hammered or doing anything like that. I respect everybody and I understood what was going on. And plus, if I'm taking pictures of guys out at night drinking, why am I there with a camera? <laughs> uh, guilty by association. So it's nothing like that. But it's just personal things that we have where we're talking and, and, and having fun as teammates do. And that's personal and that's, that's big to me. And I sure one day maybe I'll have a party and have all the guys over that want to come and watch some of them and we will. To be a fly on the wall at that party, hey? <laughs> That's very tantalizing. Just in relation to game six of the 98 finals, uh, what springs to mind from watching those last 40 seconds unfold? The shot is amazing and it's a fairy tale ending to the Bulls history, the Bulls run. I get it. But if you're talking about Michael Jordan specifically, that whole last 30 seconds, he got the basket before that for us, but also was the guy that came and stole the ball from uh, Carl Malone in the low post. And that kind of says a lot about who Michael Jordan is and what he does. And he was a, played just as hard at both ends of the floor. And I think that gets overlooked a lot, just how good he was defensively and how he understood what he can do and how he can change a game with his defense. And he did that right there. Bill, it's been great to have a chance to reconnect with you after almost eight years. Uh, thank you so much for coming back on the show and chatting about your memories of uh, being a part of this amazing second three-peat with Chicago. Um, wish you every success going forwards with the Bulls games once they resume. And just thanks again for taking time to chat with me here in Australia. Adam, always a pleasure, my man. And uh, you take care and uh, stay safe out there as, as well for you because I know it's difficult all over the world. It absolutely is. All right, Adam. Take care, brother. Thanks for listening. I welcome your interaction with the show. You can suggest topics or guests you want to hear conversations with. Send me an email. Audio clips are welcome. In all airness at gmail.com. Time to share another great review from a fan of the show. Thanks to Cool Cats Corner via Apple Podcasts Australia. It's titled The Last Dance Review and it reads, Hi guys, new listener. Now guys refers to uh, myself and Aaron Steen, a great mate of mine. Stay tuned for plenty more recap episodes for the rest of this Last Dance series that are still to come. Back to the review. Loved the pod with Scott Burrell and looking forward to going back through the archives and listening to more. Much love, Mason from The Cool Cats Corner. And I've since worked out that The Cool Cats Corner is a podcast which is devoted to the National Basketball League here in Australia. So check it out. Thank you very much, Mason. Much appreciated, mate. Worldwide, the show now has 150 ratings. It's a nice little achievement. Thank you and an average of four and a half stars with 87 reviews across all providers. Thanks for your continued support. If you add a review, I'd love to read it out on a future episode. Your ratings and reviews are one of the best ways to support the podcast. If you enjoy the show, please tell your basketball-loving friends about it. Your word-of-mouth recommendations are worth their weight in gold. Stay up to date with my podcast and subscribe to my monthly email newsletter. You'll receive exclusive details on upcoming podcast episodes future high-profile guests to appear on the show, and more. Simply email me in all airness at gmail.com. You can subscribe to my show in various ways. Search for In All Airness, three words, on your podcast app of choice. The show is on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Overcast, Android, and more. 
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show and share my web address with your friends and colleagues in allairness.com. Check out the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with high-profile guests. Follow me on Twitter at inallairness. Please add your like to the show's social hub, facebook.com slash inallairness. Join me next time for another edition of the show.